Hello, folks. Uh, what, a, what, an excellent, uh, what an excellently happy greeting that sounded like. Well done, everyone. Well done. Uh, my, name is, uh, my name is Thomas uh, Keown, and I'm, uh, I serve with the, uh, with the prayer team and with Alpha. Uh, yeah, thank you back there. And uh, I shall be reading today's teaching text, which is John chapter 4, verses 3 to 45. Yes, you heard that correctly. So buckle up. He left Judea and went away again into Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, being wearied from his journey, was sitting thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Therefore, the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink, since I am a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. She said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? You are not greater than our father Jacob, are you, who gave us the well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle? Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst. But the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water, springing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water, so I will not be thirsty, nor come all the way here to draw. He said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You have correctly said, I have no husband. For you've had five husbands. And the one whom you now have is not your husband. This you have said truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be His worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to Him, I know that Messiah is coming, He who is called Christ. When that one comes, He will declare all things to us. Jesus said to her, I, who speak to you, am he. At this point, his disciples came, and they were amazed that he'd been speaking with a woman. Yet no one said, what do you seek? Or why do you speak with her? So the woman left her water pot and went into the city and said to the man, come, see a man who told me all the things I have done. This is not the Christ, is it? So they went out of the city and were coming to him. They went out of the city and were coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples were saying to one another, No one brought him anything to eat, did he? Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say, There are yet four months, and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, Lift up your eyes and look on the fields, that they are white for harvest. Already he who reaps is receiving wages and is gathering fruit for a life eternal, so that he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this case the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor." From that city, many of the Samaritans believed in him 
because of the word of the woman who testified, he told me all the things that I have done. So when the Samaritans came to Jesus, they were asking him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. Many more believed because of his word. And they were saying to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe. For we have heard for ourselves and know that this one is indeed the Savior of the world. This is the word of the Lord. There's a myth in New York City that religious people, worshippers, go to church or other religious venues on weekends, and they lift up their hearts to their imaginary God and give their emotions and their attention and affection to Him. And then there's reasonable people who don't worry about things like that anymore, who drink mimosas and watch sports and go to the park. This is a false distinction. Everybody is a worshipper. Worship is about aligning the passion, the vision, the values, the attention, your energy and your capacities towards that which matters most. And everybody in New York City is making that sort of alignment. Alan Hirsch says this, everyone has a God in the sense that everyone puts something first in one's life, money, power, prestige, self, career, love, and so forth. There must be something in your life that operates as your source of meaning and strength, something that you regard at least implicitly as the supreme power of your life. There's not religious people and then people who are rational, there are worshippers manifesting their worship in different directions. And part of the challenge of modern life that a lot of people are feeling is that that worshipping of things that are not transcendent, not divine in nature, tend to be disillusioning and they don't satisfy. Philip Yancey says this, a society that denies the supernatural usually ends up elevating the natural to supernatural status. And you see this. There's people who impute a kind of revivalistic fervor into their sports teams. There's people who live and give themselves and pour themselves out in romantic pursuits. New York is a passion of people. That's what I love about them. Mediocre energy is spat out of this city so quickly. It's not like LA where you can just sort of drift and hang for two decades of malaise. No, it's real here. Adam Grant wrote an article in the New York Times trying to explain how a lot of people, they're not depressed, but they're not satisfied. It's coming out of COVID where everything's been disrupted and we can't make sense. How do we name this emotion? And this is the name he gave it, languishing. He said, we're languishing between things. And I want to say that what our culture is experiencing right now is not just a psychological languishing, it's a spiritual one. We're caught between time and eternity. We're caught between heaven and hell. We're caught between sin and righteousness, and we're trying to make all of these things work for us, and they're not working. We're languishing. I saw this picture in the New York Times, and to me, it, it, it just sort of stunned me. And it's a story of a, a, it's a picture, of obviously, of a woman sitting on her bed, but it's just like, we're not just, you can't just reduce us to chromosomes. You can't just re- reduce us to biology or medical technique inside of us. There are passions, desires, longings. There's like a universe, a TARDIS almost, that you can go into in a human being, that there's worlds within. And the things of this world are just not big enough for the eternal longings that we are in. And that's why, in spite of the secularization hypothesis that said when science and technology advances, people will become less religious. There's almost no sociologists who believe in the secularization hypothesis today. Science and cultural advances have made us more spiritual and more hungry than ever before. The Bible says this, you've put eternity in our hearts. There's an eternal longing not satisfied, and Christians are making the case that it must and can be satisfied by God. So here's the big idea of my talk. Let me hit with a punchline and then try and back it up, okay? God is committed to satisfying your deepest desires by thrilling you with Himself. 
He is committed to fulfilling and satisfying your deepest desires by thrilling you with himself. And I can think of no other passage in the Bible that teaches that truth and shows these desires than this beautiful encounter in John chapter 4. First thing we see from this passage is the distance God will go to stir up worship and satisfy people's longings in Himself. It's an extraordinary distance. His, his passion for worship, to create worshipers, is incredible. Again, verse 4, He had to pass through Samaria. So He came to the city of Samaria, called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph, and Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, being wearied from the journey, was sitting thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink, since I'm a Samaritan woman? And Jews have no dealing with Samaritans. Now, you're aware probably at least in some measure about the history of the Samaritans. They were a part of the people of God who got caught up in the dramas of uh, exile. When the Assyrians conquered the northern tribe of Israel, they transplanted people from around the world and resettled them in Jerusalem. And their goal was, in some sense, not just to conquer them militarily, but to conquer them religiously and culturally. So they wanted to corrupt and dilute the covenant people of God. Somehow, the Jews that were left in the land gave in to that. They intermarried, and they were a hated people by the Jews who considered themselves faithful. Everybody was looking for a reason to make sense of why they found themselves in their predicament. And their answer for the Jewish community and the Samaritans was they compromised. That's why they're where they are. And not only this, it's not just a Samaritan woman, and Jesus is not just in Samaria, it's a female, it's a woman that's in front of Jesus. Now, respectable men in that day would not be having one-on-ones with women in the middle of the wilderness. And rabbi certainly would not be having conversations like this, and they certainly would not be having conversations in the wilderness in Samaria with a woman like this. This is so culturally inappropriate, it's hard to articulate. But it just makes us ask the question, Jesus' ministry on earth was very short just a few years. And it says at the end of John's gospel that if they took time to write out everything that he did, there literally wouldn't be enough space to contain it. Here's what it tells us, that every encounter written in Scripture is one of those disproportionate teaching things, revealing something about the agenda and heart of God. And in this passage, it's revealing something breathtaking. There is no cultural barrier or distance too far for God to find you to bring your heart to worship. How far will the God of the universe come down to earth, spend 30 years in invisibility, manifest himself publicly, and then give a disproportionate, a chapter of the gospel to the story of a woman? How great the love! How far the distance, how strong the passion. The categories did not stop him. The distance did not stop him. The stigma did not stop him. God is passionate about reaching people wherever they are. And when he does close that gap and bring the encounter, Jesus makes an extraordinary offer around worship. Verse 10, Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God, And who it is that says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And she's like, okay, Um, sir, if you, uh," she said, sir, um, you've nothing to draw it with, the well is deep, Where, where do you get this living water? You're not greater than our father Jacob, are you, who gave us the well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle. And Jesus answered and said, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I give him shall never thirst. But the water that I give him will become in him a well of, or a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. And the woman said, sir, give me this water so that I may not be thirsty and have to come all the way out here to draw this water. 
Jesus is standing in front of a well and is using a physical reality to address a spiritual reality. I've been to this well as a picture of the church. It's now a church. It's, in a, it's a city in the West Bank, Palestine, called Nablus. And I didn't know it at the time. When I went there with some of my friends, everybody else that the people who took us on the tour with went with armed guards, like an armed escort. And uh, we just went in, you know, armed with the armor of God or something. In we went. We didn't know. And uh, so we go into this city, and in this city, they said to us when we were in there, you are the only Westerners in this entire city right now. And we could feel it a little bit because as we started walking through the city, like huge sections of the city started following us as we were walking. Kind of a vibe like, hey, what are you doing here? And we were here to see this. And this is a church. And if you go in the church and into the basement, here's the well. And there's no historic conjecture. This is the well. And there's an Orthodox priest who's built a, a church over this. And um, he said, would you like to drink this water? I said, yes, I would. <laughs> so I, I got to drink this water from Jacob's well. And it was, it was an amazing experience. But it was hot. We went outside and I was thirsty again. And this is something extraordinary to sit by, to sit by the well where this conversation happened. Wells in the Bible are significant. They're not just artifacts. They're significant. They carry profound meaning, not just culturally, but also spiritually. When you go through the Old Testament, and this is what she's referring to, she's talking about Jacob and his well. The well was one of the places where women could gather. There was not a lot of social spaces, certainly in mixed company, where women could gather in public. And so the well was one of the places that women could get together during the watering hours. In the division of labor, uh, women were given the task of drawing water. And so they could get together and they could come and they could build relationships. So it was one of those relief valves in a male-dominated culture, a space for women. But then what if you're a woman and you're not welcome to go to the place where women are welcome? How lonely and how isolated must you be? And you're living with a guy cultural shame, not your husband, and the women are not welcoming you. Now, Wells again, Abraham's servant, returned north to Haran looking for a wife for Isaac, and he found the local well, so he goes there, and that's where he meets Rebecca. A part of redemptive history is built around a well. Likewise, Moses, when he fled to Midian, went to a well, and there he met the daughters of Jethro, and one of those, Zipporah, became his wife. And so you see this thing again and again. People gather around the well as a source of life and marriages are arraigned, arranged at the well. And here in this passage, you have a woman who is shunned in her access and is broken relationally. And she doesn't know this yet, but here's what's about to happen. The God of the universe is going to welcome her in, but it's not just to restore her access to temporary water. He's going to bring her to be a part of his bride She's being invited into a marriage of the living God at a well. She never sees this coming, but this is the invitation for full inclusion and restoration and the satisfaction of her thirst. It's living water. And all of the imagery in the Bible, which you're probably familiar with when it comes to water, it's all the promise of God to satisfy the thirst of the human heart. In Jeremiah 2.13, God is heartbroken that disobedient Israel has forsaken God, the fountain of living waters, and hewn out for themselves broken cisterns that cannot hold water. Later in Jeremiah, he warns them that all who forsake the Lord will be put to shame. Those who turn from Him on earth will be written down because they've forsaken the fountain of living water, the Lord. Psalm 36 verse 9 it says, God's our source of salvation. He alone is the fountain of life. The book of Isaiah, it's filled with images and, and invitations to come and drink. Everyone who is thirsty, come to the waters. With joyous, with joyous sounds, we will draw water from the springs of salvation. The Bible closes in the book of Re Revelation chapter 22 by saying, anyone who is thirsty, let him come and drink freely of the water of life. The promise of Ezekiel 36, I'll give you a new heart, put a new spirit within you. I will wash you from all of your impurity and all of your idolatry. 
And this woman doesn't know it. She's trying to solve a temporary social problem. And Jesus is about to solve an internal, eternal problem in her life. And his promise is this. You will be satisfied and you will never thirst again. There's a, a picture that's uh, in the MoMA, just down the street here. Sorry, it's an art piece by uh, Bruce Nauman. And uh, it's called Human Needs and Desires. It was made in 1983. And uh, at the time, this was something special. I mean, people literally lined up to see this. And as you can tell, it's just neon blinking. Next slide. It's just neon blinking, making promises about needs. And in some sense, I've, I've seen this piece, thought about this piece, and just thought, why would anybody buy in? Why, why are people coming to see a few flashing lights? But then I thought, why are people just looking at flashing lights on their phones? It's, it's, it's almost like modern wells. We see it and we're trying to draw from it. Augustine talked about this imagery in this passage. He says, the well is the sinful desire. And our hearts want it. And so we practice evil. Evil is the bucket that we draw water from evil experience from. And so we get the desire, we take the practice, we drink down deep, and we try and get our fill. And you think about that image, and you're like, well, you know, we don't do that anymore. Of course, we do that every day. What, what is a, listen, seriously, what is a Tinder hookup? It's the need of loneliness in the heart that has a mechanism to reach in to the desire to medicate loneliness with pleasure and temporary satisfaction. But at the end of the hookup, do you really go, well, gee, that met the deepest broken needs of my inner being? Rarely. Sometimes it's, it's a job. We finally get that job, and you're sitting there, and you get the title, and, the, and you're just like, I thought it would like you reach through education and hustle and willpower, and you got it, and you... Oh, not that good. I actually need a promotion now. And now you're in the hamster wheel of accomplishment. It's in every area of our lives. And Jesus is saying to her, for you it was men. You're just burning through relationships. It's like, i got something for you. And this time, when you take the longings of your heart and you reach into me, into my invitation, you're going to draw it up and you're going to go, dang, this is it. This is the thing that I've been looking for. And this is why Christians, even though what we teach may be mocked and may seem, you know, it's treated with suspicion in our culture today, this is why Christians are standing here and they're handing out a picture of Jesus. Because we know in our hearts that the thing that everybody in the city is trying for is actually met in the person of Jesus. Now, you may be here and you're like, yeah, well, yeah, but the church is full of hypocrites. I was like, I didn't say the church would meet the deepest longings of your heart. Because the church is just filled with people. People, I've already made the case. People can't meet the deepest longings of your heart. It's Jesus. It's Christ himself. And it's amazing to me. Like people often say to me, like there's so many people deconstructing, John. Do you ever doubt? Do you ever wrestle with your faith? Do you think you'll ever walk away? My answer is like, I will never walk away. And people say, that sounds so arrogant. How could you? It's like, no, 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 not for the reasons you think. It's not based on my certainty. It's not based on my confidence in my own performance. It's based on this. I've tasted everything the world has to offer, and nothing is as satisfying as the life of Jesus. So I'm staying in because Jesus is better than anything you've got out there. It's like, this is enlightened... Someone knows. Someone's had a drink. It's true. Now, however, so often have we rerouted these longings into false things that Jesus has to confront the false wells before we can get to the living water. And this is, everyone so far is like, yeah, living water, Jesus. Now it's like, now I want to talk about your sin. And you're like, Because worship is not just an invitation. Worship is a confrontation. So Jesus goes in. And her response is, I I perceive that you're a prophet. Jesus is poking around now. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. 
And your people say that it's in Jerusalem. That's where men ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you don't know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Now remember... 722 BC, the northern kingdom was taken and and captured, and like I mentioned earlier, they repopulated the region with people, and they compromised their religion. Paganism was sort of mixed in with uh, Judaism and their covenantal practices before God, and there was a mixture that was not pleasing to God. And there was deep, deep hostility connected to this. They, the, the Samaritans didn't believe in the vast majority of the Old Testament Scriptures. They only believed in Genesis through Deuteronomy. They rejected uh, the Psalms, the histories uh, of the kings and leaders of Israel because they talked primarily about David and Jerusalem, which they refused to participate in. And so they set up an alternative worship system. They built a new temple on Mount Gerizim, And they incorporated their own way of worshipping. When Alexander the Great and later Greek generals controlled Palestine, they made Samaria one of its bases because they knew they would get sympathetic anti-Jewish allies in their place. So there was deep, deep hostility. And when the Jews had their opportunity, 128 BC, they attacked Samaria, destroyed Shechem, burned the Samaritan temple down in Mount Gerizim. They had deep, deep cultural uh, hatred. So there's a sense, and I want, I want you to see this, there's a sense where the Jewish woman is stuck in a false theological paradigm. Jesus has to confront this because worship is about uh, spirit and it's about truth. I, w- I want you to hear this. Pure worship will always reject, re- reject man-made compromises. Let, let me make this a little bit clearer. Sincerity is not enough. There's a lot of people who are sincerely wrong. Who? You, I live in America. Look, or turn the news on. Who is it? There can be people who are passionate, who are sincere, who can be sincerely wrong. Everybody believes in God, however you define Him. People are open to the universe. I had a conversation with a non-believer this week, and uh, it was with a woman, and she said, well, I don't think the universe would ever ask me to do that. I was like, the universe does not, I was just like, well, uh, okay. <laughs> when I watch National Geographic, here's what I know. The universe is not on your side. <laughs> the universe is big, fast animals eating the slow babies of other species. That's the universe. It's got to be in spirit and in truth. And that truth, and Jesus is bringing the confrontation, is manifest in Him. Fleming Rutledge says this, The world's religions have certain traits in common, but until the gospel of Jesus Christ burst upon the Mediterranean world, no one in the history of human imagination had conceived of such a thing as the worship of a crucified man. The question is not God or spirituality or the universe or even other theological or religious traditions primarily, It's about Jesus, and Jesus will always come in and look for the points of error so that we can worship in a way that is pleasing to Him. Gary and Bird says this, is in evangelism the same situation often arises. Muslims will make a last-ditch appeal to Muhammad and centuries of mosque church rivalry. They may even ask about the state of Israel, another minefield of troubles, what do you think of gays in the church is always a conversion, a conversation stopper when the suspect, when the When you suspect, folks, I'm in my 40s, when you, I've enlarged the font, I've brightened the screen, I bought the bigger iPad, and I still need glasses. What do you think of gays in the church is always a conversation stopper when you suspect that the question bears some relevance to the person's identity in life. Don't evangelicals really put down women is another statement designed to give pause. These sentences and hundreds of them, and like them, are attempts to deflect the real issue at hand. Jesus won't have any of it. In John 4.10, we learn his double agenda. Do you know Christ? Will you drink his living water? These are the two questions. Do you know Jesus? Do you want living water? And again, it's very, very popular uh, in our culture today to just say, hey, you do you. You believe what you believe. Sincerity is not enough. 
Jesus will always lean in and try and bring us to truth. But secondarily, and this is where it gets harder, Jesus will confront our sin that is stopping us from worshiping him. And this, this one's hard. So, but isn't Jesus merciful? He's so merciful, he's going to remove the sin from your life that is corrupting you. So what does Jesus say? She's like, I'd like some living water. He says, go get your husband. At this point, she's like, this was going so well. <laughs> Did you say living water? No, I said, get your husband. And I, honestly, in this moment, I just think, oh gosh, what's, what's she going to think? What's she going to be feeling in this moment, this pressure, this pain? Oh, there was a moment of hope. Look at this Jewish leader in the middle of nowhere talking to me about living what are you? But, you know, it always comes back down to this. I can't get past my past. But Jesus knows this, that what she's been drinking from and wanting hasn't worked for her, and he's offering her something better, but she's got to acknowledge it. She's got to acknowledge it. And this is one of the things, like, so... Most people in their relationship with God experience this part of their journey. It's like, wow, Jesus. And then Jesus is like, yeah, me. Like, this is incredible. And he's like, I want to confront all your brokenness and your sin. And people are like, oh, no. Oh, no. It's, but that's what love is. It's a confrontation with the things that are untrue, that destroy us, that distort us, that break our hearts. And Jesus has to lean in here. And so I want to say this to you. If you're exploring faith and you love all the parts about how God is hope and life and love and freedom and joy and all of that, that's true. Stay with it. But he's also holy and he's also just and he hates sin and he hates evil. And he loves you so much, he's not going to let those things that will kill your spirit stay in your life. Go get your husband. What would Jesus say to you? Go get your, go bring your, I want to talk to you about. There can be a sense where we're going to shrink back in fear because of the confrontation. But here's what I want you to see. Though Jesus confronts us, he does not condemn us. He's not having, Jesus did not leave the glory of heaven, come down on earth, manifest himself as the Messiah, come all the way into Samaria, find this woman who's covered with shame to hold her face in her shame. He came to free her from it, restore her identity and her dignity in the midst of it. It's a beautiful act. This is what Jackie Hill Perry says. Could it be that God would not have me going about the rest of my life believing that these lesser forms of love were the real thing? Perhaps this love he, filled to the brim with, was pouring over into his dealings with, with me. And perhaps this love was compelling him on the basis of grace and undeserved love to help me see that every person, place, or thing that I loved more than him could not keep its promise to love me eternally. Oh, what's God now? If you know Jackie Hill Perry's story, I mean, she was, she was pulled out of a few things. And that was a painful reaction to her sin. But look at the lyrics that flow from her life. Look at the books that she has written. Look at the joy that comes out of her. The Father's seeking worshipers. He's going to deal with bad theology, false theology. He's going to deal with sin. But here's what's going to happen. It's going to result in true worship. Now, again, I said at the start of the talk that true worship is about the proper recognition and realignment of our affection and our ten attention and our energy. Attenergy is a new thing I'm working on. It's like a, anyway, all of these things together pointed towards God. And this is what happens. She has this realization. Jesus says to her, she says, I know that when the Messiah comes, he would, just, he would declare all things to us. And Jesus says, I who speak to you am he. Now, it doesn't say that in the Greek. In the Greek, it says, I am. That's one of those things where Jesus is saying, you know the Messiah you're looking for? It's me. You know the God you think you worship? It's me. I am in front of you. And what I love about this, two things that are happening. Number one, Jesus is wanting her to see the primary issue is not a fight between the Jewish community and the Samaritan community, though there's truth about the origin of where salvation is and where you stand. 
Jesus is upgrading her vision to the new covenant by saying, but all of that is fulfilled in me. And this is what John is doing in the Gospel of John. At the start of the Gospel of John, John chapter 2, Jesus turns water into wine. What's he saying? He's saying he wants to bring celebration out of the ceremonies and formalism of your previous religion. What does he do when he confronts Nicodemus? Here you've got a teacher of the law. And Jesus comes along and says, my teachings are superior to your teachings. You can't even understand my, my teachings, which are spirit and which are life. Jesus goes into the temple and surprisingly says, I'm going to tear this thing down. And in three days, it's going to be rebuilt. And it's going to be about me. This system is going to be replaced by this person. And the whole time he's wanting to upgrade her vision. And what he's saying in this passage, passage right here, is that my well is better than Jacob's well. My well is better than your tradition. I am the fulfillment of Jewish tradition. Don't get caught in that. See me for who I am. And she does. She recognizes Jesus. And you can just see this elevation of the person of Jesus through this chapter. Let's go to the slide that shows this. It starts off with Jesus. And then it goes to, you're a Jew. And then it goes to, sir. And then it's a conversation about him being a prophet. And then it's about the Messiah. And then it's the I am. And then it's teacher, rabbi. And then it ends with, you're the savior of the world. She goes through every category about who Jesus could be. You're a good teacher. You're a prophet. But she ends up by saying, you're the savior we've been waiting for. And ultimately, that's what worship is about. You see that Jesus is a moral teacher. Why can't we get rid of Jesus? And you read the gospel and you're like, by golly, this stuff's good. You start reading it and you see his kindness, his compassion. But where you end up is Jesus on the cross, dying for our sin, rising again on the third day, defeating sin, Satan, death, and hell, ascending to the right hand of the Father. And the only thing you can do if you give the gospels a fair reading is to say this man was the Savior of the world. That's the journey you go on when you see Jesus properly. And here's the beauty of this passage. So many people missed it, but this sinful Samaritan woman saw it. It's just about, it's not where you're coming from. It's your response to the revelation of who he is, elevating Jesus. And the fruit of this, the result of this, is a celebration. From that, so she, Jesus not content just to have this encounter with this one Samaritan woman, goes into a Samaritan village. And she runs in, she goes, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Like, that's good news. Come and see a man. He's like, I got busted by God back here. The power of this, though, is she's no longer ashamed of her story. She sees this doesn't disqualify her. This actually qualifies her to bear witness of the grace of God. The true Messiah this is amazing. Come see a man who told me everything I did. And then every, all the other Samaritans say, this man is the Savior of the world. It's a celebration. When a woman in this social standing is running into a village and going to the man, screaming out about the Messiah, something good has happened in her life. It's not secret. It's not shame-based. She's not ostracized. She's not isolated. She is public. She is filled with joy. She is declaring she is celebrating. When I became a Christian, one of the things that genuinely hindered me was the expression, the celebratory worship of this Pentecostal youth group. It was just, it was too much. And let, me let me tell you something right now. Pentecostal worship in the mid-90s. I mean, it was a thing. Did they have flags? Worse than flags. They had baggy pants that bopped flag-like. I mean, they, did a, they had like a Pentecostal pogo. It's what we called it. And it's like, dong, 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 dong. You know, you'd hold your Bible up. And people were like waving. And they had songs like, celebrate Jesus, celebrate. And then people were like, do, 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 be, do, be, do, do, do. It was just wild. And I was just sitting here thinking, nah. Uh, no, was, that's, that's not it. That's too much. That's too much. Because I, I didn't understand what, why they had that much joy. Now, I was so into surfing at this time. You take me down to the beach and you show up and there's just sets of waves. And I was like, come on! High five, male hugs in wetsuits. I'm like cheering. I had all the physical responses, but they were rerouted to nature, not to the divine. 
And I remember after I became a Christian, the first time I worshipped on my own, and I'm talking deep, deep Hillsong archives. I'm talking Jeff Bullock deep. I'm talking power of your love. I'm talking shout to the Lord. And I'm telling you, there's these things called CDs, okay? They're these flat, the flat little disc-like things. And they had these big machines and you put them in. I had a CD player in my room because I was high tech. And I remember putting this in. And then I just remember the presence of God coming into my room. And I remember seeing it and getting it. And I remember, honestly, I just remember. And there were songs like People Just Like Us all over the world. People Just Like Us are worshiping. And I found myself involuntarily doing the Pentecostal pogo. It wasn't just, uh, it wasn't like mimetic desire. It wasn't social conditioning. It just was like, I got I to gotta jump for joy, man. I gotta, I gotta, I'm feeling this. I remember putting my hands up, wanting to punch through the, the shout to the Lord. It was an extraordinary experience. And what was happening is my salvation, which I understood was having expression through celebratory worship. And that's the good news of worship. God did not come down to affirm Jewish superiority over the Samaritans so that she would have a long cultural struggle. Jesus came to connect her to the Father through himself so she could drink living water and be satisfied. And here's the hope in this passage. And it's also a challenge to, to those of you who maybe have a lot of Bible knowledge, but you don't leap for joy in your hearts. Here's what it is. Nicodemus shows up in the previous chapter, and he's got from the right tradition... And he's spiritually inquisitive, but he's scared and he comes at night. This woman's from the wrong tradition. She is not scared. She stays when she's questioned in the light, and they have a completely different response. It's going to take him a long time to say yes to Jesus, and she says yes in a moment. This is a beautiful, beautiful vision. Martin Lloyd-Jones says this, the ultimate test of our spirituality is the measure of our amazement at the grace of God. The measure of our amazement. We've got to get, we've got to get a fresh sense of wonder and amazement. Many of you know that um, outside of Christian worship, I think Bon Iver is probably the closest thing to Christian music. If you don't, if you don't, if you don't know about that, I can help you with that later. So I've seen Bon Iver a lot of times, I'm going again this summer with my friend Dave Blanchard. And I've seen Bon Iver three times with amazing tickets. And, uh, and then once I couldn't get good tickets and I was in the nosebleeds. And I don't know if it's just because like I'm too old and I've had too many good experiences, but I'm just like a nose, I'm not a nosebleed guy anymore. I'm like premium experience or no experience. So I, I did stadium two and nine rows from the front. And it was just, it was just amazing. And uh, just, I'm, just caught, I'm just caught up. I mean, it was just amazing. And I saw him in a little small show in Brooklyn. I was the oldest, chubbiest person in the entire room, surrounded by kids. And I was into it more than any of them. And I was, behold, young generation, Watch cultural appreciation. I was so into it. It's amazing. And then I got the nosebleed seats. And I was so far away from the action. And I looked at all the people down the bottom and I just thought, they look like idiots. Look at, yeah, look at them all. They just look like idiots. And I had this revelation. Distance from the stage creates superiority and judgment in the heart. But when you're in there, I'm not, I'm not in there thinking, I'm a middle-aged guy. I, I'm not self-conscious. I'm in it. I'm in. I'm immersed. I'm surrounded. And I was praying this morning, and I just was thinking about proximity to this stage, and I thought, you know what it is? When you're not close in walk, when you're close with Jesus, you're not self-conscious. You're God-conscious. And all of your behavior is about Him. You're swept up into it. But when you're a great distance from Jesus, you're judging other people's devotion and judging other people's expression. 
And I just want to just invite you today, if, you're, if you have sort of condescension, if you look at these young people worshiping and you think, oh, you know what, they don't know anything about life yet. Easy for them to worship. They haven't been through anything. You're too far from Jesus. And if you're here and you're like, you know what, I don't mind the teaching, but the worship's just too much. Like I come late to skip the worship because it's too much. Can I just say to you, the teaching's only to get you to worship. This is not the point. And so I think what Jesus is saying is like, you've got to get close to the stage again. There's like no, no nosebleeds in the kingdom of God. It's all throne zone. It is all down the front. This is where it is. I think God wants us to recline, to break that spirit of respectable worship. I'm not talking about personality types, okay? It's like, well, it's easy for you to say you're outgoing. I'm so introverted. Honestly, I probably need drugs for it. This is about heart response. Again, Martin Lloyd-Jones says this, a characteristic of dead, of dead orthodoxy is a dislike of enthusiasm. A characteristic of dead orthodoxy is a dislike of enthusiasm. A dislike of enthusiasm can be one of the greatest hindrances to revival. And so I think that what God is saying to us today is, is like, come closer. Come and see again. Get that vision. Get that revelation. Come back to his word. I shared this with you guys I, did, I did, had to do this podcast about the Gospel of John. And so I had to read the Gospel of John. And I was so in awe of the person of Jesus reading the Gospel of John. I had to put it down, do a lap of the block of Hell's Kitchen. I did 44 across to 8, in tears weeping. If you saw me, you would have stopped me and said, John, are you all right? And I was just walking around going, he's the bread of life. He's the light of the world. He's the good shepherd. He's the door. He's the true vine. He's the way, the truth, and the life. He's overcome the grave. I was so caught up in it. Just from reading it, not even commentaries, just reading it. That's what happens when you get in His Word. You get in His presence. Look, Jesus doesn't promise Christian programming will satisfy the deepest needs of your heart. He promises He will. And he's inviting us in. So I don't know where you are today. Maybe you're here, you're not a follower of Jesus. And you're like, oh, oh, this one felt very, very... Who brought me today? This is like a setup. Maybe it is. I'm not even sorry. I'm glad you're here. Maybe God loves you enough to confront you about your thirst and the place you've been trying to meet it. And he's giving you an invitation today. Come and drink of him. Come and drink of him. Maybe you grew up in the church, but then you got lost in the city for a few years. You just lost your way. But you're realizing it's not as good as they said. It's empty. And you want to come back. You can come back. All you have to do is say, Jesus, I want the living water that you offer me. So I want us to respond today. If you'd stand to your feet. I I want us to respond by just obeying this passage. I want us to respond by being people who worship and bring our thirst and the hunger of our hearts to him. I'll say this, if God's spoken to you in a particular way today and you need prayer for something, we have prayer counselors over here. They'd love to be able to pray for you. If, you're not a, if you are at a place where you're just like, right now, I actually need to give my life back to Jesus. Like I've, been, I've not been right with God and I want to get right with God today. These folks would like, you literally would make their day to day if you needed prayer for anything. And if you've got something in your life where you've been drinking from a false well, And you want to say today, I'm putting that aside. They'd love to be able to pray for you, with you, over you. But more than anything, I just want to call us to be a church of passionate worship, to see Jesus for who he is. You got passion. You couldn't make it here without some base level above average passion. And I'm just saying, point it to Jesus. Point it to Jesus. So let's respond in worship. Let's lift up our hearts, lift up our heads. Thank Him, honor Him, and praise Him. And if you need prayer for anything at all, they'd love to be able to pray for you today.